Hello and welcome to Catch Up with Community Church. It's so good to have you listening to us today. Now, this is a time to catch up with the preach that was on Sunday. So whether you have missed it, whether you were serving, whether it was that good, you want to listen to it again, this is the place to be. But before we get into that preach, we have David preaching on First Peter starting off our new series. We're just going to hear a few notices. So firstly, Alpha is coming up on the 23rd of January. This is your last chance to invite someone. So please invite someone, get booked in. It'd be great for as many people as possible to be able to come to that. We have two trainings coming up, Growing in God Revelation, where we go from the book of Revelation, starts on the 11th of February, and our church planting course starts on the 29th of January. Those will be both be monthly, and of course our weekend away is a year's time, but you can book in now. That's on the 24th to 26th of January 2025. Also, if you're not part of a life group, do consider joining one. They are an important part of Community Church, and it's great to have a small group to share fellowship, and actually get some more spiritual support as well from them. But that's enough of the notices. Let's listen to David preach on 1 Peter verses 1 and 2. Um, Today we're we're, um, we're, we're stopping doing our online services every week. We'll still stream uh, on the first Sunday, um, which is why I've got this little device here because um, we're going to record it and then it will be available as a podcast, just audio only, um, from hopefully tomorrow uh, for anyone in youth work and kids work that want to catch up. And if you want to listen again and those that are not able to be with us uh, for whatever reason. Um, so we are in a new series. And um, we've called this uh, series... Uh, uh, elect exiles, which comes from our, our passage today, actually, right at the beginning of 1 Peter. Um, and uh, I want to just encourage you, really, to, to get into this book. Uh, it is a great book. Uh, and, and so, so we're going to go through this. Actually, it's going to take us many months to go through uh, this book. And, and so I want to encourage you to read it and reread it and, and keep going through it. And, and we're going to really get into studying the word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Um, we, which means, actually, we can't miss anything out as we go through 1 Peter. We're not going to miss anything out. We're going to deal with all the subjects that come up. Some might be a bit difficult. Some might be a bit challenging. Some might be hard to understand. But we're going to go through it all. And we're going to make sure we, we learn from the scripture. We, we want to be a church that is based in the Word of God, okay? which means we, we, we've got to get to grips with the Word of God. Um, for those that uh, like to go deeper into the Word, we run our Growing in God course. Last year we went through Genesis, and we went through it a little bit of time, really getting deeper into the Word of God. This year we're going through Revelation. Okay, we, we, you saw it come up, you know, it's going to start soon, and that's just going deeper into the Word of God. We, we need to be based in the Word of God. You know, that's one of the key things. We want to be full of grace and spirit-led, but it's got to be based in the Word of God. So we're going to go through 1 Peter, and we're starting today, and this is going to be many months of wading through uh, this book. I want to encourage you, if if you want to go a bit further, uh, this is a great commentary. I always recommend the Bible Speak Today series, um, nice and easy read. I mean, you can get commentaries that are full of Greek and I don't understand them, um, but this is very understandable, okay? This is really helpful, um, and and if you want to to follow and to read a commentary, uh, I would recommend this one. Um, The Bible speaks to a whole series of them. Uh, Edmund Clowney Clowney has done that one. But uh, we'll we'll hopefully give you a little bit of an overview of this letter. So so we're, we're in the first letter. Uh, of Peter, that's where we're going to be. And when you come to uh, a new book, when you come to study something, there are some questions that it will be good to ask. And um, so these these questions, when you when you when you look in Scripture, we want to understand uh, what's happening. So you might want to ask these sorts of questions: Who is the letter written to? Okay. So so where's this going? Who are the people that will have heard it? read out 
uh, on that first occasion? You know, what was their situation? Uh, and those sorts of things will help us to understand the, the, the scripture. Okay, so, so who was receiving this? What did they hear? And how would they have received it in their context and in their culture? Um, who wrote the letter, when and where? Also very helpful to know that in history uh, where that would be, uh, what, what was happening at that time. And then um, what is the genre? Okay, we're in the epistles, so this is a letter. Um, but what is the genre that we're reading is, is a very good question to ask. Uh, the, you know, the Bible is full of different genres. Okay, narrative, um, prophecy, poetry, you know, etc., etc., ap- apocalyptic. You know, there's lots of different genres here, and this is a, a letter. And then, uh, finally, um, what are the themes? What what are the big themes coming out of this passage, or as we're looking at a book out of the book? You know, so, so those are good questions to ask when you come to any passage of scripture um, and when you're studying something like this. So. Let's see if we can answer some of those questions for us. Who is the letter to? Well, um, if you open your Bibles to to the first letter of Peter, it tells us right there in verse 1 who the letter is to. Um, It's to the churches in uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, which actually is most of modern-day Turkey today. That's the region that we, we are talking about. And uh, so that's the, that, that, if you get in your mind, that's the, these are the people that will receive the letter, okay? Uh, and, and these are the people, this is where, a little map there to show you where it is, which is modern day uh, Turkey. And uh, we, obviously, uh, the, it, interestingly, uh, the actual title of the book, um, the first word in the book is Peter. Um, and, and so the letter's called the first letter of Peter. There are some people that dispute that Peter actually wrote that, but most scholars, most commentators would say, no, no, this is Peter. Okay. They, one of the things that they, the, the Greek that's used here is, is quite high and, and, and quite good, and they say, well, Pete was a, Peter was a fisherman, uh, and, uh, and therefore his Greek wouldn't have been that, that standard. Um, but that was a long while ago, that's 30 years ago. Uh, and, and surely his Greek would have improved over time. Um, and he might have had someone scribing or someone helping him with that as well. So, so most scholars today would say it's Peter. And uh, around 80, AD 62, 63 uh, sort of time, um, we're looking at So quite early on, you know, about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, there would have been many eyewitnesses still alive uh, to, to that. I mean, you know, there were a lot of people that would have known Jesus and, and seen him and heard him firsthand. Uh, Peter obviously being one of them. And we believe this was from Rome. Later on, he talks about Babylon, um, and, and, and we believe that's with reference back to Rome. Uh, and so we, we think this is uh, from Rome. He's, he's, he's writing this from Rome. Uh, and we expect this was after Paul's departure. So there's no mention of Paul in the letter. Um, and in some of Paul's letters, there's no letter mention of Peter at this, this particular time. So, so after Paul's departure, but before, which is really important for us to understand as we go through this letter, before Nero's persecution really took off. Okay, So, so we'll come to this a little. There was persecution, but not the level that happened when Nero started then to proactively state persecution, if you like, of Christians. So it's just before that time there. So just to put it in our mind, what we're talking about and what we're thinking of there. And then the, the genre, of course, is an epistle, it's a letter, and it would be circular, a circular letter, um, going from church to church to church to church, all in that region. Uh, so, so it would have been carried um, by a messenger, and they would have read it out at each church, and then go on to the next one. So a circular letter, it would have been a pastoral letter, you know, this is to encourage and reassure uh, the Christians in Asia Minor, you know, either just as the persecution is starting or, or just the ongoing opposition and slander and, and persecution that they faced uh, at that time. So it would be a pastoral encouragement to everyone who would hear it. And then the key themes. Well, yeah, in, in this letter, I mean, Peter is talking about uh, imploring, really, and, and, uh, and encouraging God's people 
uh, to live a different life to the rest of the world, to live distinctive lifestyle as temporary residents in a foreign land, which is where the exiles come from. Okay, the, 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 this is not our home, you know. And 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 it was. This is one of the themes that comes through. He 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 knows that we're going to suffer for Christ. He knew that persecution was there and was coming, and he encouraged them to hold on to the hope and the future. This is one of the themes. Uh, the, the epistle resonates just as powerfully today for us as it did then. Okay? The same thing, hanging on, hoping for the future, knowing when we face opposition that we're not really part of this world. Um, and, and all of the universal anxieties, uh, struggles and hopes and fears that we all go through. There's something in this for us today. Some of the things to look out for as we go through, obviously, um, the, the focus is on Jesus Christ. Um, Peter centres his letter on Jesus. So look out for all of the references to our Lord and Saviour, um, and it's really helpful, his salvation, his death, his resurrection, uh, the reality of what God has done in Jesus. You know, all of those things are coming through this letter. He proclaims Jesus as sure hope for now and forever. You know, those sorts of things and directs our identity is in him. Okay, so we're looking out for those sorts of themes coming through, uh, the concept of grace, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. There is also a, a theme of eschatology, which is a, 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 a theological term um, which talks about end times, that which is to come, you know, the, the, the death and judgment uh, that is to come, the return of Christ Jesus. Uh, there's the second coming. There's a, there's a theme like that running through uh, this letter. So look out for things like that and, and how we as God's people are made ready for his return. So look out for that. There is obviously uh, a theme of suffering. Okay, the, 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 this is a massive theme through it. How do we remain, remain steadfast uh, in the spite of opposition and persecution? And again, that's very relevant for many of our brothers and sisters, especially today in other lands where they are facing terrible persecution, even death, um, because they love Jesus. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was... Uh, just uh, having breakfast with someone this week and he was telling me he had a call with someone in another country which I won't name and he said it's not been a good month he said four of our senior leaders have martyred this month uh, and, and, and so this, is, this letter is relevant today in fact there's more people being killed for the gospel today than there ever, ever has been okay so this is really relevant for us uh, today so suffering and, and, and what that looks like for us um, even today. So, so, so Peter's talking about this um, and, and what that looks like. I've put down uh, Sojourners and Strangers, um, uh, which is living as exiles, okay? Strangers and aliens, okay? That's, that's who we are. The theme runs through this. I was, um, I was in a rock band in my 20s and we used to write our own songs and one of the songs, and it, used to, it was the title actually for one of our albums, um, Strangers and Aliens, uh, was one of our songs, you know, and, and this is where it comes from, okay, that we don't belong here, guys. This is not home. And we'll see that theme running through this letter. We're, 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 we're pilgrims in a foreign land, okay? Th these are some of the things. So I want you to look out for that. Um, and then finally, um, well, not finally, but the next one is finally on the, on the slides. Uh, the Old Testament, there's lots of quotes from the Old Testament. Again, it's good as we go through this to say, so, okay, he's quoting Old Testament there. Go back to the Old Testament context, see how it comes in, see what he's referring to, see the anom how he's, he's bringing the picture into the New Testament, the New Covenant, a new people. Um, there's about 20 direct quotes from the Old Testament, plus many uh, allusions to the Old Testament uh, story uh, that we'll see here. So, so there's a lot of theology in this, there's a lot of uh, doctrine in this, but there's some very practical things to look out for as we go through the book. He will be talking about holy living, how to deal with authority, um, how husbands and wives should be together. He'll talk about church leadership. So there's a lot of practical stuff as well. So we're going to be looking out for these themes as we go through this book.
And hopefully uh, it will equip us to live in the 21st century culture and the, the place where we are and it will help us, uh, which I believe in an increasingly hostile and unbelieving world. Okay? We may not be facing persecution, but brothers and sisters, it's coming. Okay? And this is the sort of teaching that we need to help us to stand and to stand firm. So, as we journey through this book, I'm hoping that it will help us with our journey through life as we go to our everlasting home. And uh, this is the story that we're going to unpack as we go through 1 Peter. Okay with that? Yes? It's just a short introduction. If you want to do the more, get a commentary. Or if you've got the ESV and study Bible, there's some stuff in there and, and gives you a bit of background uh, on this letter. But you'll see this sort of stuff coming through uh, as we journey through. So today, if you open your Bibles to 1 Peter, we've got just two verses today um, that we're going to be uh, reading together. Uh, and it's the first two verses um, and uh, let me read it to you. I'm reading from the ESV. You might have a slightly different version. Um, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Christ, so Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what I'd like to do is just to, if you've got your Bibles open, then use your Bible, but if not, just look at the screen here. Just take a couple of minutes for you individually just to look at that. Say, so what is the Lord saying to you from these two verses? What do you already get from this? Uh, just to, I, I'm just going to pause and let you have a chance just to reflect yourselves uh, on these two verses. And then I'll pray and then we'll open it up together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and I pray as we make a start into this wonderful letter that, that Peter wrote to the churches, uh, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us in your truth. Lord, that we will have these truths really illuminated in our hearts, Lord, and it will help us to live for you, to rejoice in you, to know your grace and peace in our lives. And Lord, when we are facing tough times, when we are suffering, when we face opposition or even persecution, to stand and to stand firm until that last day and to know that our joy and our hope is in Jesus for this life and the next. Amen. Amen. So I'm not sure what you... you, you, you I've got loads to get through and I'm not sure I'm going to get through it all in the time that we have. But let's, let's make a start, shall we? First of all, uh, we see uh, that it starts with Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter doesn't have to say much about himself, does he? When you read some of Paul's letters, he's defending his apostleship. Uh, he's trying to, to, to win them over to who he is and things like that. Peter has none of that. The ap apostle means sent one. Okay, that's what literally apostle means, the sent one. Uh, and and this, just for him to say, Peter, an apostle, it just emphasises the authority that Peter had in the early church. You know, they knew Peter. You know, he was called by Jesus Christ, okay? He was, he was called. He had seen the risen Jesus. You know, he established and governed the church under Jesus, you know. Uh, he had the authority to speak and to write uh, words uh, of God, which are, are looking, and, and we look at them, equal to the Old Testament scriptures, you know. So, so Peter had this authority 
as one appointed by Jesus and sent by him. It doesn't have to say much else. I'm Peter. Everyone knew. Ah, he's been with Jesus. He's got authority. Jesus sent him out. And if you remember, when G- uh, Peter was the first person to confess the, the lordship of Christ. Jesus, Christ, you're the son of the living God. You know, he was the first person to confess that. And Jesus said to him, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. You see, the, the confession that he made of, of, of Jesus as Lord was, was that Jesus said, I'm going to build my, my church on this confession. And others that will confess, you know, that it's, we're not built on Peter alone, okay? But he, he was the first one uh, to, to confess the lordship of Jesus. You know, he's not an isolated stone. You know, other apostles uh, we use. And in fact, as we go through his letter, we'll see that we're, we are living stones, Okay, so, so we're all part of the building of the church. Um, but, but Peter was the first one who, who, who said that. His witness is strong. He knows what he saw and heard. He was well known wherever the gospel was preached. Now, it, it, we believe, he says, uh, Peter, he, he, see, he doesn't say, uh, I, my name is Apostle Peter. No, he didn't, have a, he didn't put something before his name. He introduced himself as Peter. But his calling, his ministry, was an apostle. Okay. So, so th- that is one of the reasons I love to be called David. Not Pastor David or Elder David or whatever you want to put as a prefix. Um, because actually, we are family. You know? And I do believe there's, there's honouring and, and there's leadership and, and there's, there's authority in the ministry that we're given. I'm an elder of the church, so there's a, 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 the, the God has put something in me and the other elders to shepherd and, and to oversee and to teach. You know, there, there is that. But first and foremost, we're family. We're brothers and sisters. And so Peter just starts, Peter, an apostle. Okay. And, and we still believe in, in apostolic ministry. We don't believe that the, 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 the apostolic ministry finished when, when the canon of Scripture finished. Now, we still believe that today we have apostles. Now, not in the same category. I would say this. I, I wouldn't put our current day apostles alongside Peter and Paul and the other apostles and say, look, they're the same. No, they're not. Okay, they're not. You know, our current day apostles are not writing scripture. You know, they don't carry the authority that they had. Peter had been with Jesus. He'd listened to him, he'd seen him, he'd seen him die and, and rise from the dead. Now that, that level of apostleship is not seen today. Okay, so some would say that the, the, the apostles in the New Testament have a capital A, and the apostles now have a small a, just to make that distinction. But we do believe in apostles today. The Ephesians 4 ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. And those fivefold ministries are working in the church today. And, and the, the ministry of an apostle, which Peter and, and other apostles started and, and were part of, continues today. The, the work hasn't finished. The, the ministry of, of advancing the gospel, preaching to people that have not heard, preaching to whole people groups that have not heard, planting churches, raising up leaders, that ministry, strengthening churches, is it, still continuing today. And so we believe in the ministry of an apostle. And we see here, uh, Paul, when, if you're going to join me on the, on the church planting one, we look at Acts, we're going to look at the ministry of, of an apostle. Okay? What actually did they do? And we're going to look at the nine church plants that we see in Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to unpack the, 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 the work of the apostle, the ministry of the apostle, and how does that impact our church planting today. So we believe uh, in apostolic ministry that started in the New Testament with these uh, super, if you like, apostles, um, but continues today. And in fact, we belong to an apostolic family of churches, so we're about an apostolic ministry. Whether you like it or not, we are an apostolic church. Because we're about advancing the gospel, planting churches, preaching the gospel to new people groups, new towns, new cities, and seeing Jesus glorified. We are all sent ones to some degree. Okay? So, so we, we are part of this apostolic ministry. And here we see this introduction. Paul says... Pizza, Peter, I, w- I will do that a lot, I think, because I'm so used to preaching about Paul. Peter says, uh, apostle of Jesus Christ. First, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
That's, that's where his authority comes from. That's where his allegiance is. That's where his ministry flows from, is Jesus Christ, and should be for us all. So, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he goes on, to those who are elect. And we see this word, elect, and this is, uh, this is going to be a theme running through uh, uh, First Peter. This is something we're going to be looking at as we go through, and it's something we see here right at the beginning of this letter. After introducing himself, he then addresses the recipients, and he identifies them as elect exiles of the dispersion. And he talks about Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which is, as I said before, modern-day Turkey. Now, interestingly, if I just go back to the map, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I will. There we go. Um, you see that Bithynia and Pontus uh, are on, both on the shore of the Black Sea. They're together. The Romans put them together as one province. Um, but Peter lists them separately. And he may have had in mind, if you go through it, uh, starting in Pontus, going to Galatia, going to Cappadocia, going back to Asia, then back to Bithynia before returning. So he may have had in mind a route here that the letter would go on, um, possibly with uh, Silas or Silvanus, depends what uh, translation you're using, would have taken that letter or another messenger taken a letter. So, so, so these are the people he's writing to. But interestingly, he calls them elect. And Go back to where we are. These were, were a diverse people, and they're mainly Gentile churches, non-Jewish churches. They would have had Jewish believers there. Um, if we go to Acts chapter 2, this is, this is very interesting, well, I found it anyway. Um, Acts chapter 2, when the, the day of Pentecost was there, and, and they, they, um, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and... Uh, they were talking, there were lots of people outside heard this, and in Acts chapter 2, uh, it says, verse 8, How does it we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia is there. So there have been Jews from Cappadocia right back there in, in, in Acts chapter 2, seeing this move of the Holy Spirit. Pontus is there in Acts chapter 2, and Asia is there. Okay? Um, and, and, and so, so the, though they were Gentile churches, there would have been Jewish believers that have gone and been dispersed, uh, the, this diaspora, uh, out into this region. And so they would have been there as well. And so and, and if you look at the geography, when you get chance, there's, there's, there's coastal regions, there's mountain regions, lakes, plateaus, rivers, you know, it's very diverse in that way as well. And, and the inhabitants would have had different origins, different languages, different ethnic roots, and, and different customs. And, 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 and there's no reason to believe, that when he was speaking to this Gentile church, that it was no less diverse than the community in which they, left, that, that they lived in. And so we, we see that, 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 the, that, the, that Peter was writing to Jews and Gentiles, mainly Gentile churches, but a diverse church different cultures, different languages coming together under one lordship, under one king. The beauty of intercultural church. God has blessed us. He's put a grace upon us to have an intercultural church here at Chafford 100 and at Community Church, wherever we are. I think it's a blessing of heaven. You know, this is what the kingdom's going to look like when Jesus comes again. Different nations, different cultures, different languages, worshipping one king together. The, the beauty of this diverse people of God. And, and I believe this is what Peter was writing to, mainly Gentiles. Uh, and, and when you think he's writing to mainly Gentiles, and he says this term elect to them, which means we're chosen, we are chosen by God, which would have just blown the mind of Peter and, and the other Jews to start with, you know, that, that somebody who's not Jewish can be chosen by God. You know, um, I don't know if you, this whole thing about being chosen is so special, isn't it? You know, that we're chosen. Any of you, I, I, I don't know if they still do this in schools, but when I was in school and we used to play football, we used to line up and they'd pick two captains and then everyone would stand in a long line and then you'd wait for your name to be chosen. And, uh, and, and you, sometimes you're standing there for a little while. Um, 
I wasn't so bad when it was football, but if it was any other sport, I would have been at the back of the queue. Uh, and you think, oh, come on, please choose me, please choose me, come on, please choose me. And there's something about being chosen, isn't there, that's very special. Ah, yes, someone's chosen me. Okay. For those here that are married, you know, you, you, husband and wife, you, you, you chose to be married. Okay, there, there's a choice. Uh, uh, most, mostly in our, in our culture, there's a choice. Okay? But isn't it beautiful that my wife chose me? What, is that? what a blessing. There's something about being chosen. And, but but the, the, even more so for the Gentiles. You think, you know, the, the Jews, uh, you know, we knew they were elected. They knew that they were from Father Abraham all the way through. You know, but, but the Gentiles, you've been chosen by God. He's chosen you. This is amazing. It's significant. And, and when addressing these Gentiles churches, the persecuted Christians, he focuses on election. He focuses on election. I want to say that identity really matters for us. Identity really matters. I've gone too far, haven't I? I can't see that from here, so let's go back. There we go. Identity is so important. We live in a culture that is obsessed with identity. Okay? It's mostly self-identifying and self-identity. We as Christians have our identity elsewhere. Okay? Identity matters. God has chosen us. Historically, the Gentiles would have had no part in this election. It was the, the Jews, Israel, that would have been elected. Jews would say that they are the people of God, passed down from generation to generation. Peter 1 verse 18 says the Gentiles hadn't inherited this election. They had inherited the futile ways from their forefathers. This is why we think it was right to a, Jewish, uh, a Gentile church, because the Jews wouldn't say that. Gentiles, we've just inherited futility. We've not inherited God. And so, so there was something new here. But now, in faith through Jesus Christ, they become part of the elect. Some other uh, grafted on, you know, to the elect. God's holy people. And don't forget, Peter had to come to terms with this himself. This, this doctrine that actually Gentiles can be included in, in the people of God was something that God had to really work with Peter to convince him of. You remember in, in, in Acts chapter 10, Peter's vision, uh, when he was on the roof cooking food, and, and, and the, this, this came down, the curtain came down, and there was different animals and different foods, and, and, and he said, oh, I can't eat that. And God said, no, no, don't say what's clean and what's unclean. I decide that. And then he went off to Cornelius' house, who was a Gentile, and he started to preach the gospel there. And the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius' house, and they started to speak in tongues. He said, how can we stop them being baptised? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Mind blown. Wow. And, and he would have had to grapple with this. They had to talk about this. They had to go back to Jerusalem and grapple. Paul would have been there. Look, th th we believe the Gentiles can be pe part of the people of God. And they would work through this, looking at Old Testament scripture and trying to get their heads around this. In Galatians, Paul had to uh, publicly oppose Peter because he'd slipped back, you know, to just siding with those that are circumcised, the Jews. If you read that in, in Galatians 2. But, but Jesus had changed Peter's heart. He changed his doctrine. He changed his mind. And he knew, now had this understanding of what it means to belong to the people of God. It means anyone who follows Jesus. It's not about our lineage, our genealogy, our culture. It's about a decision to follow Jesus. And as we go through this, we'll read um, in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. It says, you are a chosen race. Wow, imagine hearing that. When you, as, a, as a Gentile, when you've been excluded. Even in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a separate part for all those the Gentiles sort of thing. You're not even allowed in. And Peter says, you are a chosen race. Wow. You are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Wow. This is just incredible stuff. Peter affirming who they are in Jesus Christ, knowing that, 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 that who we are and whose we are is important for us. Identity matters. And we want the, the Holy Spirit to completely, to, to continually remind us of this, of who we are, where do we belong. He has chosen us. He's chosen us. Ephesians 2, verse 10, says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. The, the, each one of us, he's chosen. Now, there are some things that we need to understand from this then. Okay, If we are the elect... Wow. As, as a, as, imagine saying, some people say that Christianity is inclusive. Okay. If we don't take this position, we would say, and I think I would say, that Christianity is exclusive. Now, just listen to what I'm saying here. The message, the gospel message goes out to everyone. The Bible tells us that God wants everyone to be saved. You know, there's no exclusion there. You know, Jesus died for the whole world. There's no exclusion there. Whatever your situation, whatever you're thinking, whatever you have done, whatever you have not done, the way to Jesus is open to everybody in the world. This is why we preach the gospel. But Christianity, the church, is the elect, predestined people of God. And that's exclusive. You cannot belong to the church unless you've put your trust in Jesus. It's exclusive. And, and I, I'm hoping and believing that everyone here has, but the visible church may not be the spiritual church. And so th there is something here that, 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 that we are elected, we, knowing who we are, and, and, and it encourages us, it strengthens us, it gives us authority, it, it, it builds us up because we know we belong to the King of Kings. It's his choice that we, we belong there. He's predestined us to belong to him. This also means that we can't boast in our own works. Who thinks they had anything to do with their salvation? Anything at all? Nothing. They say, ah, oh, no, but I made a decision to follow Jesus. Yes, you did. You had to make that decision. But even that is a work of the Spirit in your life, stirring your heart to have enough faith to take that first step towards Jesus. Salvation is because God has chosen you to belong to him. And it's by his grace. By his grace. We cannot boast in our own works. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. I need to go quicker. I haven't even started yet. Um, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Who saved us and called us to his holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. <laughs> this is not just something that God is making up as he goes along, which we'll come to in a minute. It's good stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's good stuff. This also means that we cannot stand condemned. We're not condemned, we're not guilty. Romans 8, 33, who can bring any charge against God's elect? It's God that justifies. You see, th this is so important to us that we know who we are and whom, uh, whose we are. You know, we, we, we need to know that. It's our identity. It's, it's absolutely central to our faith that we know that God has chosen us. And, of course, this is not just for this life, but it's for eternity. 
Anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will have life and life eternal. And again, I just want to say there may be people here that have never ever taken that step of faith. And I believe the Holy Spirit is at work. You wouldn't be here if he's not. Because the Holy Spirit has brought you here to hear this message. That there's something wonderful, such beauty, knowing that God loves us. That God has chosen us. That he wants to adopt us into a family. That he's got life for us, abundant life now and everlasting life. I want to say to you, don't leave this place this morning without making that decision to follow Jesus. And if you do that today, we can baptise you next Sunday. That's great, isn't it? It's wonderful. And so, so we have this, this, this identity, if you like, that it, because we've been chosen by God. But at the same time, on the one hand, we're elected, we've been chosen, uh, and we belong. On the other side, we're exiles, we're rejected, we're, we're opposed. You know, so we have these two things going on in our life, you know, that, uh, that we are elect exiles. We, we belong, but we don't belong here. We've been chosen, but we've been rejected. And so, to be in God's election means that we are exiles. The two go hand in hand, okay? Now, if you've got... Uh, Granville mentioned notes, uh, and uh, you've got those other little things called coins anymore. Um, there's a heads on one side and the tails on the other side. You can't separate them, can you? They're, they're the same. You turn it out, it's, it's one coin, but you've got heads and tails. This is it, this is one coin. We're elect, but we're exiles. If you choose to follow Jesus, then you're going to be rejected by the world. When you choose to follow Jesus, you realise this is not home. You've come out of this kingdom and into a new kingdom. You know, the, the two go hand in hand. We will be rejected by the world. And Peter establishes this fundamental defining identity of, of the church, his recipients of this letter, uh, and who we are as Christians. We, 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 we are received by God, but rejected by the world. Exiles. Now, Again, you won't help, hopefully, those that have been Christians for a while, you won't help but notice the Old Testament parallel here. Okay, the, the, the very word exile coming from the Old Testament, and, and the elect as well. But, but this, this whole thing of exile, um, the, the Old Testament exile of, of God's people going, uh, you've got the exile of uh, Israel into Assyria, the exile of, of, of Judah into Babylon, you know, and, and all that we read in the Old Testament, this whole thing of, of God's people being in a foreign land and, 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 and crying out just to go home. Bring, bring, Lord, bring us home, take us home. You know, we want to be back home. There's this whole Old Testament, Old Testament allegory here that we see that Peter is drawing on, um, the, the Old Testament story. And, and, it, and what Peter is saying here is, is that this, this new church, Gentile church, is the church of Jesus and are God's chosen people that are in exile. So he's actually now overlaying... Israel onto the new church. You know, dispersion, he talks about the, the dispersion or, or diaspora, points to this same truth. You know, the, the God's people scattered through the world in exile. This is, is the scattering of Jews in the Old Testament, the, the diaspora. That's what it's talking about. It, it now, we're talking about the, the God's people, the church through the whole world, the parallel that Peter is there. I want to say as exiles, we will face, and increasingly so in this country, we will face rejection, marginalisation, opposition, and persecution, maybe one day. Our brothers and sisters in other countries are already facing all of that. We may be just increasing into those areas. But we are God's chosen ones. We are God's chosen ones. And we're looking and we're destined for eternal glory, not this earth. So our eyes are going to be fixed on something greater. And, and we know that he is with us through all we, all, all we go through. And, and I suppose that we could, we'd add into this that just the normal everyday pain and suffering of a fallen world. There may be people here this morning 
that are really struggling in things, persistently sick, we'll pray for healing for you. But that's part of the world we live in. There may be things going on, arguments or, or, or problems or, or, or lack or, or whatever it is. This is part of where we are. And, and, and we, we suffer as part of a fallen world, but our eyes have got to be on, actually, there's, there's, more, there's better things to come. I mean, we're one day going to be a place where there's no suffering, no pain, no sickness, no death. And we believe we can pray for these things and God can alter them. Absolutely, we're not, we're, not, we're not lacking faith in these areas. But we also have a reality, that's the world we live in. We've sung some great songs, thank you team for leading us. That, uh, it, we sang this, I will fear no evil for my God is with me. We also sang right at the beginning, it is well with my soul. And it says, our scars are a sign of your grace. What a beautiful line. Our scars are a sign of your grace. You know, there will be suffering, especially for the gospel. And there may be little things at the moment. You know, you may refuse to wear that rainbow-coloured lanyard because that's not what we believe as Christians. It's just a little thing. But it's the start, I believe, of what's coming. God is with us. The world rejects us. So suffering for our faith should never surprise us. Should never surprise us. And this should stir us really and fuel our passion for Jesus more and more. So let's look at our response on some of these things. Um, election should lead us to worship. Number one. We should be worshipping Jesus. If we know that, that God has called us and chosen us, then he deserves all the glory, doesn't he? So it should lead us to worship. And I, I, even during the week, just put some worship on and just give him the thanks for all that he's done. Because he's chosen you. He set you apart. When Paul was reflecting on these truths in Romans 11, this is how he reacted. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given him a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. That's the sort of worship that we're talking about. When we reflect that God has called us. Election should encourage us to evangelise. Now, there are some who would say, well, what's the point? If God has chosen somebody, we don't need to worry about it. Let God do what God does. No, that's not the way of the Scriptures. That's not the way the Bible teaches. We, 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 it's not, election is not a hindrance to evangelism. Actually, it spurs us on. You know there are people out there that God has chosen. And they're just waiting for you to share the gospel with them. They're just waiting. There is fruitfulness in our gospel sharing. Because God has chosen many people. So it should spur us on to have boldness with the gospel. Knowing that some will respond. In Acts, when they were sharing, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured that they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord. And listen to this, it says, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. You see that? The gospel went out, and those that God had chosen believed. So since God is sovereign, because he's chosen, we should be sharing the gospel. Election should be, make us humble. We're all in the same page here. Sinners that were dead in our trespass, raised to life by the grace of God. We're all in the same boat. It's only because of him. If we're living for Jesus, we should expect opposition. If you're not getting any sort of opposition, and we're not really here at the moment, but there will be people that don't agree with you. But if you don't get people to disagree with you, maybe you're not speaking out. Because I tell you, once you speak out about Jesus, people will disagree with you. And we have to be gentle and gracious and patient and kind. 
but we should speak out. This is what we believe. You know, we, we don't want to conform to the values and the worldviews of this present age. We don't want to do that. We've got a gospel. We've got the word of God, which never changes. You know, if we grow comfortable in this world, we start accepting the ways of this world. We do not speak up for Jesus. I don't think we're going to get any opposition. It's a nice, easy life. But it's maybe what, not what God has called us to. And with election and being exiles, we must continually long for our true home. There's something about death which should excite us. That might surprise some of you. Paul and I were talking about getting old earlier. And I mean, are you ready to go? Why not? I'm ready to go home. You know, imagine this beautiful, glorious life that, that is waiting us in heaven. You know, that is our home. We're not home, we're exiles. We should be longing to go home, looking forward to that day. Death should be a celebration. Now, we may not want to suffer much to get there, but, but it should be something we're longing for, guys. And when we see, we had the, the beautiful funeral of Shirley uh, before Christmas, and when we see a faithful servant, we will celebrate that now they're at home. We might miss her, but she's at home. Wow! <laughs> it does make me wonder some of our theology uh, when I'm in a Christian funeral. In the world, they can do what they want. It's up to them. But when you're in Christian funerals, it's ah, such and such is done. And now they're with their friends and with their, uh, their spouses. And they're, I say, No, they're with Jesus. Come on, get our, get our priorities right here, guys. <laughs> Forget all that other stuff. We're with Jesus. You see, being exiles should give us a continual longing to get home. And in the same way, we should be completely, continually praying for Jesus to return. We want Jesus to come back, don't we? And we've got work to do in the meantime. We need to spread the word. Because the Bible says that Jesus is not going to return until the gospel has gone to every nation, to every people group. So we've got work to do. And actually, that should stir our evangelism. The more people we tell about Jesus, the quicker he's going to come back. This should excite us. And just as a bit of comfort for those that are struggling here, our suffering is temporary. The pain, the hardship, the struggles of this world won't last. There's a new morning coming. The joy is in the morning when Jesus returns. So we're exiles. Not only exiles, but we're God's elect exiles. And I pray that this will... Help us and remind us of the mercy of God, the grace of God, our new identity and our citizenship in heaven. Okay, that's verse one. <laughs> it's good stuff though, isn't it? This, this should really stir our hearts, really. It, it, it should, you know, we should be leaping up and worshipping and praising a few amens and hallelujahs wouldn't go amiss. Then, very quickly, we go into the second part, the second verse. Um, it says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, and for the obedience of, to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. Now here we see the, the work of the Trinity, the triune God. You know, you see, the God at work here. And, and I want to say that more and more in my, in my life, I know we've, we, we worship one God in three persons, but everything I see is the whole of the Trinity is involved in everything. You know, I mean, there are specific things. You know, Jesus died on the cross. You know, the Father and the Spirit didn't do that. So there are some specific things. But, but even when, when you come to, I think it's Romans 8, um, just, just to realise that actually we, 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 we do know this. Um, and I didn't prepare this, so let me just find it. Here we go. Verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, if the Spirit of God, which is the Father, does not, dwells in you, anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the Son 
does not belong to him. So you see, even in that verse, you see, the Holy Spirit in us is the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son as well as the Spirit. You see that? So the work of the Trinity is amazing. In creation, you see, oh, God spoke, which is the Father. Ah, oh, but the Spirit was there, hovering over the waters. And then you read later on in, in, in John, uh, uh, Jesus was there. All right. So, so the whole Trinity was created. You see, the, the work of the, the Trinity is key. And here we see the work of the Trinity uh, to, in our salvation and sanctification. Again, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You see, we are God's people because God has foreknowledge. He's chosen us. You know, it doesn't really just be, refer to him knowing who's going to belong to him, um, but who would, uh, uh, in advance, but uh, would belong to him ongoing. Okay, this is an ongoing thing. His foreknowledge. Okay, uh, Romans 8, verse 29. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his sons. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. There's something here that, 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 that must blow our minds again. That actually God has chosen us, he's elected us before the world began to belong to him. His foreknowledge. So we are... We are, uh, we are who we are, we are because of the foreknowledge of the Father. And then we are sanctified in the Spirit. You know, the sanctification here may refer to our initial salvation when we're initially saved. It's the Spirit's work in our life that brings new life. And when we are saved, if, if, if uh, my earlier uh, appeal to those that are not saved earlier, you come forward and talk to me afterwards and you follow Jesus, immediately you're declared holy. You might have been the worst of sinners, like Paul described himself. You might have done awful things, but the moment you step into faith in Jesus Christ, you are holy, you are justified, you are not condemned, you are accepted. That's the sanctifying work of the Spirit. But as we go through life, we, as we're declared holy, we're called then to live holy lives, set apart lives. And it's the ongoing work of the Spirit that takes us day by day, month by month, year by year, from glory to glory, to be more like Jesus. Is at work in our life. You know, if you've got, you know, when you're saved, you are declared holy and righteous, and you're accepted into the, the very throne of God. But you might still have anger issues, or you might still have drinking issues, or you might still have this issue. The Holy Spirit then works in these areas to change us. What's the issues that the Spirit's working on in your life to change? From glory to glory. The Spirit sets us apart, but he continues to work in our lives from glory to glory. And then, for obedience to Jesus Christ and his sprinkling for his blood. Now, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Okay, when we, when we're, 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 we're chosen by God, when we're sanctified by the Spirit into a new life. We're sanctified to be obedient, to follow in the ways of Jesus, to follow his commands. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We love his truth, don't we? We love getting into the word. You know, we love his life, the beauty of, of, of a living with Jesus. But sometimes we're not so keen on following his ways because that's a bit, bit tricky sometimes, a bit hard, and takes us out of our comfort zones. You see what Jesus actually did so I want to do the same. Wow. Obedience. Obedience. For the sprinkling of his blood, again we see this coming back to the Old Testament here. It refers to Christ's atoning work on the cross, of course, when his blood was shed and all of our sins were washed away. But it, it, it flows back into the Old Covenant again. Exodus 24, Moses speaking, he sent a young man uh, of people who so offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of the oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and be obedient. There's the obedience. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people. He sprinkled the blood on the people. Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with his word. So Peter's seeing this, this Old Testament image of the sprinkling of the blood and say, you are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. You are brought into the covenant of Jesus by the blood that's been sprinkled upon you. So 
So God has chosen us. The Spirit has sanctified us. And our lives have been set apart for obedience to Jesus, who has joined us into his covenant through the sprinkling of his blood. What wonderful truths. And then, finally, this last little bit. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is not a hallmark card greeting, okay? This is not just a, a, a wish. Is, I think we, we need to understand, you know, we, we are first of all blessed. First of all, let's, let's take this. We, we, the privilege of being the elect and being chosen is that we receive the grace of God, unmerited, undeserved favour of God. Election is by his grace. And so, so may grace multiply to you. It's say, yes, we've received grace and we want to walk in grace. We want to be a people of grace and we're going to deal with each other in grace. One of our values is that we want to be a grace-filled church. We've received grace, so we're going to be walking in grace. And then peace. You know, peace is not the absence of problems or not the absence of conflicts. That's not the peace we're talking about here. You know, it's the state of a heart and mind of a believer who is walking with Jesus, knowing that we've been called and knowing that we've been chosen and knowing that we're going home one day for eternal life. That gives you peace. Grace and peace for us come through prayer, talking to God, listening to God, comes through the obedience to Jesus, comes through the word, comes through communion. You know, the more we do that, the more peace we receive. When we try to do things in ourselves, when we're caught up in the world, trying to do this, no, then our peace starts to disappear. When we're focused on him, then we have peace. And this greeting that Peter brings to the church should be a greeting that we bring to each other and to those around us. And I'm not just saying this is a, 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 a normal greeting that we would get every day. You know, Abraham was told, you're going to be a blessing, so you, you, you be blessed so you can be a blessing. You know, as elect exiles in a world that is fallen and broken and dark and hopeless, we can bring grace and peace to everyone we meet. And that should be the blessing of elect exiles in a fallen world. That we bring something to the world as salt and light that changes the atmosphere, changes the, the, the people, changes people's hearts. And through that they will see Jesus. This is just not a common greeting uh, every day. The, the church used these sorts of greetings, but they really meant it. They wanted to bless one another. Now, this is real. This is the blessing of God. When Jesus sent out his disciples, Luke chapter 10, he said, go to a house and say, it's a peace be upon you, shalom. That was a normal, but if your peace rests upon them, then stay, if not go. There was something real about that blessing that could be tangibly seen and known because if they wasn't there, if they didn't receive the peace, then you're to move on. So this is not just a greeting, this is real. Those are our... Um, Crossover service, we sang that song, The Blessing, which was made famous during COVID. Um, beautiful, beautiful song. And we sang it once and we were just singing at the front, they're looking at the screen. I thought, that's not right. That's not right. And I said, let's sing it again, but let's pray, let's look at each other. Let's bless one another, you know, because this is, this is, this is about being a blessing to others. We are blessed so that we can Bless. The church of God is special. It's nice to be special, isn't it? It's nice that we've been chosen. We've been set apart. But of course, by that, our relationship with the world has changed. This should encourage us. I hope that it encouraged you this morning. Well, let's not get too comfortable in the world because we're just passing through, guys. We're just passing through. This is not our home. God has chosen us, and he's got a great eternity for us. So whatever you're going through, just know God is with you. It's only temporary. And ultimately, the victory is Jesus. When he comes again, or he takes us home, we will see the victory of Jesus over all of these things.
Don't get too comfortable. You know? Sometimes we've got visitors in our house, they don't get too comfortable. You're going to go in a minute. <laughs> yeah? Don't get too comfortable. This is not our home. Are we living as if it is? Or are we living as exiles? Knowing that we're chosen. Time has really, I really flew past, I've got lots more to say, but I, I'll put that in the life group notes so you can pick up some of the other things that I missed out on that tonight, today. So um, I, I wonder, let's pray, let's pray. And then I would love to be singing again. I did say this to Grandpa that we're singing, It is well with my soul. There's something about knowing that we're chosen, knowing that we're exiles. We could say, It is well. It is well. Grace and peace are mine because I know Jesus. There's something about that I think it would be good to reinforce for us. And then as we sing, I'm just going to be over in the corner there, um, or if you don't want to come forward then uh, afterwards, after we finish, come and see me. If you say, I need this peace, I need to know the grace of Jesus, I want to follow him, I want to know that I've been chosen, I want to know eternal life, then come and speak to me because it will be great. I'd love just to help you to make that first step to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for these beautiful words that you have chosen us. Lord, we did not choose you. You chose us. You stirred something in us that we may respond to this glorious call upon our lives. Thank you that you chose us before the beginning of time. Thank you, Spirit, that you have sanctified us, that you have made us acceptable. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross, that your blood was shed so that we might be forgiven and set free. And thank you, when we come into your family, we receive such love, such peace, such grace. It's beyond understanding sometimes, Lord, even when the world around us is, is so uncertain. Lord, we put our trust in you. I want to pray. I just want to just pray for those here this morning that are in tough times, struggles that they're going through. Lord, I just pray that you will strengthen them by your grace. Lord, I pray even this morning as we open these two verses, Lord, that they would have been strengthened by your word. But Lord, we do pray for healing, where healing is needed. We pray for changing circumstances where that's needed. Lord, we pray for unity, we pray for harmony, we pray for peace. Lord, because we know you're a God that can do these things. And Lord, I pray that you will keep our eyes fixed on you and our eternal home, knowing that we are pilgrims in a foreign land. So that Jesus, you will be glorified through your church. That we will be the set apart ones, the holy ones, that will live differently to the rest of the world. And even when we face disagreement, opposition, or persecution because of our faith. Lord, we will stand firm. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love. Thank you, Father, for your great love. Thank you, Spirit, for your great love. And Lord, we receive you into our lives today and each day until that time comes when we are gloriously united perfectly with you forevermore. Thank you. Thank you for your church, Lord. Thank you that we're joined together. Brothers and sisters, a part of being elected is we're adopted into this family. And so, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your church. Lord, just wherever we're scattered this week, we know we're still your church. We still belong to you. So, Spirit, help us, embolden us, strengthen us, and give us the grace to live for you, for your glory, we pray. Amen. I hope you enjoyed and got a lot out of David's sermon today. 
next week we'll be meeting at our separate sites that's Chafford 100 Chaddo St Mary and South Ockingham that's at 10 30 check the website for more details catch up with community church should hopefully be out Monday morning if not sooner so please check back then wherever you get your podcast to listen again have a great day